Hi there, Michaela here with Michaela's Counseling. Um, talked a couple weeks ago about avoidant attachment. Those clients are super fun to work with. So are folks with um, preoccupied attachment. It's interesting. I was just double checking this before I came to make this video because I wanted to make sure I had it right. Did you know preoccupied attachment is also called, called ambivalent attachment? And it's interesting because this is kind of, the words focus on two different really elements of this experience. So the preoccupied is like, it, it's like, um, well, I've heard of the dismissive attachment style as described as like, you kind of try to turn your attachment needs off, right? You try to, um, you know, deactivate the, the, um, the desire for connection. And um, preoccupied, I've heard, is um, <laughs> liked the designation of you turn it on and on and on and on and on, right? It's like, um, it's like you're with this style, the, the inclination is to keep turning to somebody else, right? For a sense of stability. And it, it arises a lot of the time when, when you've grown up with somebody who wasn't dependable in, in offering the connection that you needed. So you could have had a caregiver who was like really unreliable for any number of reasons. Um, could have lost them, they could have been sick, or they could have had like their own emotional kind of unmet needs or ways that they were they were unavailable. That's one way it happens. Another way it happens is if you had a parent that really um, wanted you to stay young, cute, needy, adoring, right? And so um, in, in that kind of situation, like it works fine when you're little and you're cute and you need them for everything, but you start to assert like independence, you start to show your own preferences. And what you learn is that they're just not there for you unless you are acting needy, unless you are showing them adoration. And so people with this style, they can learn to act kind of little or to act kind of confused even when they're not. Um, or, um, and you know, if you have the style, you don't do this on purpose. You definitely are not doing this deviously, but there is kind of this unconscious way that you will, you'll amplify your own distress. It's kind of like you give the really hard feelings the megaphone. So maybe you're going and you're about to give like a speech or something, or you're working on something, and actually you've got this huge confidence, this huge charisma, and you're brilliant at it. But then like a friend or a counselor asks how you're feeling about it, and maybe you go, oh, I'm just so nervous, and you find yourself fixating on the one piece of it that might not go right, or like the audience member that might not like it. And, you know, it can feel frustrating for you. And it can feel frustrating for other people. And it can it can seem like being like an Eeyore or Debbie Downer or whatever. But, but what it really is, is like on some deep level, you learned young that what worked the best for connection really was to keep that level of distress high. And, you know, that that was how you kept people from going away. And it makes it makes perfect sense or, you know, to try to keep people from going away. Um, because, you know, the, the, the really, really sad thing about this is like when you were OK, when you were secure, when you were solid in your own kind of sense of who you were, you likely, whether your your parent meant to or not, got messages of like, oh, you're not as interesting now or you got this. And so you, you were able to go um, to people with insecurity, but you weren't actually able to be celebrated in your security, in your developmental milestones, in, um, in your interests, you know, in your differentiation, the things that you felt that were maybe different from what your caregivers felt. So it's, um, you know, it's a really smart strategy and, and obviously it can get you into trouble later on. So what are the problems that people with this style tend to have? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about like what they're like in your life and then what the troubles are like once you're in counseling, because that's not smooth sailing either for reasons I'll explain. Um, but it's still totally, um, it's workable. And with somebody that is, um, that's alert to attachment patterns, um, who knows a little bit about this and who's willing to navigate it with you, you can develop a great deal um, more security than you have now. 
So, um, okay, so the problems that people with this come into counseling for, um, I mean, they often feel distressed and they feel distressed around relationships. They feel like other people aren't there for them. Um, a lot of people, by the time they come in for this style, have um, some pretty judgmental designations about themselves. I'm so clingy. I'm so needy. Why am I so stupid in my relationships? Or why do I act so helpless? Or why do I call every romantic partner until, you know, until they block me on their phone, right? Like, there's this thing where, like, people are aware that they're like really, really, really focused on like a partner or a best friend and that there are ways that this gets in the way. There are ways that this ends up sabotaging um, connection. People also come um, feeling unclear about their goals in life, feeling unclear about who they are. And the really, really beautiful thing about that is a lot of the time it's one of the um, first times that the person has felt the permission to ask the question of who am I really, what do I want really, after maybe a lifetime of trying to please other people, after a lifetime of trying to fit the status quo, there's finally this sense of like, hey, I'm an individual and I have wants and needs, and I don't know that I've ever learned what they are. I think I've spent so much of my time focused on the outside that it's been really, really hard to find out what I want and who I am. So those are the top two issues, I'd say, is like just a sense of lack of clarity in life goals. Um, also difficulty, though, with traction to move forward, which again, if you think about it, if you've learned that the best way to keep connection is to be distressed and confused and disoriented and to not know who the heck you are, then there is actually there, there's an interesting bind because even as you do start to develop confidence, as you do start to get kind of these inklings that maybe you're really smart or maybe you have like these really cool goals and you want to move forward on them, there's going to be an instinctive fear that comes in as you express yourself, as you express differentiation. So this starts to lead into the issues that come up in counseling. So one of the issues that comes up in counseling is that um, hope joy, connection, these are paradoxically really, really scary. And here's where we get into the ambivalence. It's not just that you're preoccupied with getting good connection, because if that was it, you would um, find yourself in the presence of somebody who's really loving, really attentive, really wanted to help you figure out like who you were, and you'd be able to just like soak it in, right? You're not, though, because along with that kind of preoccupation for somebody to offer answers or to help meet your needs or to help soothe you, there's also that memory, and it's like a body memory, and it's an automatic thing of this feeling that, like, well, but nobody will really be here for me consistently. So issues in counseling, feeling connected with a person who's there. You know, um, I worked with somebody who had this style um, years back, and it was such a learning experience experience that whatever counselor she was with, she was always pining for somebody else. And she'd always fired these other people for reasons, right? And yet there was the sense of grass is greener. And there was this way that we really needed to be with the sense of like, you know, Michaela, I'm sitting with you. I get that you're saying caring things. I get that you're here for me. I get, you know, I get all of that. And yet, and yet my focus is on um, what I can't have, or my focus is on this person that I fired, or this person who's in Louisiana, or, you know, this person that broke up with me. And so it's really interesting. It's the ambivalence. It's like connection is here, and yet I am so terrified to actually grab a hold of it because the memory is that it's going to be taken away, um, that it's not going to be stable. Um, and the memory is also that it's going to be almost like toxic in a way. Like, say, the you do grab a hold and we're really connected, then the fear is that it's going to become a vice grip and you're not going to be able to find yourself and your own way because your map of connection isn't about being able to be yourself and being able to explore in the world. So such a bind. Um, so issues in counseling, um, feeling dissatisfied with um, the counselor is a really common one. And it, by the way, it's really important if you do have the style and you feel dissatisfied, there's still going to be valid reasons for it. So we don't ever want to write it off as all attachment. Um, but that's one of the that's one of the patterns. Um, another pattern is yearning, just a really deep yearning. You know, like um, there are these young needs for you that went so unmet for so many years and it's like, 
when you start to feel compassion from somebody, when you start to feel somebody like listening intently to you. I mean, the fantasy sometimes is like, well, I want to, I want to move in with you, right? Um, I don't, I don't want to go home and be all by myself. It's like the sense of loneliness can amplify. Um, also, paradoxically, you can come in to learn about meeting your own goals and finding yourself, but you get snagged, right? You start to find more of who you are, and then there is the immediate kind of jumping over to um, actually a fear that your counselor disapproves. So it's like you find your own voice, and then and then you start looking, you start scanning for threat. Um, a fear of rejection and a tendency to see it where it isn't. By the way, folks with dismissive attachment style do this too for different reasons. Now, one of the really f interesting things, I was about to say fun, and I, I don't think I want to call it fun because I don't want to trivialize it, but kind of funny sometimes. Um, sometimes people think that they have dismissive attachment. Sometimes they think that they have dismissive attachment when it's actually preoccupied or it's ambivalent. And the reason they think that is they're like, um, well, you know, I haven't, I haven't called my, um, boyfriend for 10 days. I don't care what he thinks. I don't care if he's here or not, right? Here's the thing. Um, people will do that with this style in kind of a desperate attempt to get away from the sense of need, but they're still fixated on it. They're still looking at the phone, and they're still, at this point, maybe working to project an image of needlessness or maybe feeling a sense of helplessness about the other person being there, but it's still, um, it's still very externally focused. And one of the really, really heartbreaking things about this is like people with this style will, will try to cut off their own sense of desire for connection because they've learned that they're too much. They've learned that it's too much. They've learned that people are going to go away. And so it's a really, um, there, there's a lot, there's a lot to these people. And I, I kind of want to use that as a launching point to some of the really, really hopeful things. Um, one really hopeful thing when a person with this style comes to counseling is if they stay with one person who's steady enough, um, they're, they're likely to be some of the more consistent folks. Um, in, in counseling and in really working to improve their lives. Um, another really lovely thing that I see working with this style is these people are very often brilliant, um, very often very connective. And like there's the, there's the connection, there's kind of the pseudo connection, right? Like where they're, they're kind of trying to dial in what I want. That's not so fun, right? It's not fun when they're being like, oh, you're the most brilliant therapist on the planet. Just like my last few therapists, because I'm afraid that if I don't tell you that you're amazing, you're gonna, you're gonna go away. But, um, <laughs> where was I going with the good part? Oh, the, the genuine connection. These people also can be just really, they, they haven't um, gone to the dismissive strategy so much of pretending that people don't matter. Um, they know that connection matters and their ways of connecting when they're spontaneous and when they're from a sense of self are just really, um, really lovely, really beautiful. Um, they're, they're heartfelt, um, as they, as they find their, their genuineness. Um, so people are often brilliant in ways that they haven't really tapped into. And that is like really super fun to get to sit with somebody and help them figure out that they learn to stifle how smart they were. They learn to stifle their intuition, their perception, their wicked sense of humor. Um, these are people that have held, that have held so much inside because again, by being small, by being weak, um, or by just being hyper attuned to other people, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't get to let their light shine. And so seeing that happen, I mean, it's magnif magnificent, really fun. Um, so the, the thing that, I mean, there, there are a few goals with this. Um, one of them is learning ways to, to regulate yourself. And that can be really, really scary because 
A, we learned self-regulation by getting regulation from other people and when we didn't have that enough when we were young. The tendency is to look outside and there's a valid piece to that. It's kind of like you do need somebody to actually help model regulation to help you to calm down, right? But it can be scary to learn to do it yourself because even if you don't mean for this to be there, there's going to be a fear that if you demonstrate that you can calm yourself, other people aren't going to have an interest in you anymore. But, but that's one of the goals, really. It's like, um, well, and it's not just self-regulation. It's actually learning to regulate with another person because another really fascinating thing with this is that with the style, you're going to turn to other people for soothing and also they're not going to be able to soothe you. Um, really, really interesting kind of push-pull, right? Um, you might ask for calming techniques, you might ask for ways to feel grounded, and you might not actually realize that there is something in you that is afraid to let a calming technique work or to let yourself feel grounded. Because if you think about it, if you're calm and you're grounded, maybe you're not hyperactivated and maybe you're going to miss a cue of somebody else that they're that they are available that they're absent and so the very things that you're coming into counseling and working um for are also some of the very things that your style is going to be is going to be frightened of right um and then it's also really scary to be soothed by somebody when there's that fear behind that soothing of like uh oh like this is in short supply this is the only time um, I'm going to lose it. And then, so one of the really important things for counselors to be aware of with this is that even if we're helping somebody to feel better, the first thing that they might actually do paradoxically is feel worse, right? And it's, it's just that, it's just that fear. It's that fear of finding hope. It's that fear of finding connection and needing to get a sense of here's another goal, a sense of solidity and stability, a sense of like, this counselor is going to be here for me. Um, and equally importantly, like getting a sense that you're going to be there for yourself. You're going to find out what you want. You're going to find out what you need. You're going to give yourself that support that you need to go forward. And you're going to reach out to other people in, um, in ways that really work to, to help you get the soothing that you need. Um, there are a couple ways that this one plays out, by the way. Um, it can play out in like a passive way as like a kind of constantly waiting for somebody. Um, a lot of the time these people are really, really, really good at enlisting help because they've learned to... Um, to really turn on the charm or to turn on their sense of need. And so other people do things for them. And um, so that the more the more passive style though is it really is that kind of sitting by the phone waiting for for somebody to call you, right? Um, hoping that somebody will pick up on it, that you you have the need that you have, right? And the ambivalence plays out like much more quietly. Maybe you go to like quiet helplessness, quiet resignation. Then there's the angry style. <laughs> and the angry style is like demanding that people be there for you, right? And you demand it and you also let them know that you're angry, that they're not doing it right, that it's not enough, that, um, you know, and so with with that style it's like there's there's a lot of protest and it's not um it's not because you're a mean nasty person it's um it's because there's just so much um there there's so much pent up for you there there have been so many unmet needs and it's like there's just this kind of this kind of scream inside and kind of this like wanting other people to get it you know, how strong your need is. And it can also be that ambivalence. It's that difficulty. Like, even though somebody's here, I don't feel soothed. And I am so angry about that. And the adaptive piece of that is that, you know, we have every right to be angry. When we're young, we're dependent on other people, our needs aren't being met. And protesting is really, really adaptive. Um, as you get older, not so adaptive. And uh, one of the saddest things with this is that uh, people, people's counselors, uh, people's partners, people's friends will take them all too literally sometimes with their dissatisfaction because it's a, it's a chronic theme. A lot of the time, not being satisfied, not being satisfied with the help, not being satisfied with the care, not being satisfied with the tone of voice, not being satisfied, you know, with the length of time. And it's, um, it's not, it's very often not actually a literal 
request for something to be different. It's like an expression of something of this internal mind of like, nothing feels enough. And so, um, a lot of the payoff in counseling is really learning to find out what's happening inside, how it is that you dim your own light and, um, how it is that you're so vigilant to the counselor and so vigilant to their cues that it's really hard to, um, to touch into your own heart, your own cues, your own desires, um, and to also actually be able to study, like, wow, <laughs> I'm desperate for care and I'm desperate for attention, and yet you offer it to me and I don't feel it like that at all. I don't trust it. I think it's going to go away. I think it's not good enough. And if you've got somebody who can be compassionate, curious, playful, and notice what's happening for you, it's actually going to help you to actually learn a couple different things, to learn that there are people in the world where you can have a whole variety of emotions. You don't have to please. You don't have to say that you're happy when you're not. You don't have to say that you're helpless when you're not. You get to be angry. You get to be dissatisfied. Um, that, that's one thing that helps develop is just like really getting a voice for all these different feelings that would not have had a voice when you were growing up. And then the other pieces, um, by studying this, we, we start to learn kind of like how we, how we trick ourselves, you know, um, how we trick ourselves into actually eluding connection, even when it's right there. Um, and this is a big aha for people with this style because their map is like, they're not worthy and that's why they don't have a lot of connection. And, um, the truth is that they're ambivalent and they haven't realized it. They haven't realized the ways that they're, they're doing push pull. And so um, over time, you can end up with a really, really stable connection, I promise. And it'll take some time. And it'll probably be a little bit spotty in the beginning. And probably one of the signs of progress will be feeling like you're sliding back or feeling like looking for somebody else. <laughs> New toy. You know, um, kind of that leaping from thing to thing. Um, but it's all it's all perfectly workable. If I if I had a piece of encouragement for you with this style, kind of starting out with a counselor, find somebody that you feel like a modicum of um, safety with. Find somebody who maybe wakes up some of those yearnings for connection, but who obviously has like boundaries, right? Stay put. Stay put if you can for a while and actually study what happens in that relationship because if you are about to move on to your 10th counselor and all of them have kind of fallen short, it's, um, A, I believe you, they probably all have in some really valid ways, but B, there, there's probably something going on with you that makes it really, really hard to, to stay somewhere. And so one of the, one of the best things you can do for yourself, in my opinion, one of the best investments that you can make is to find somebody safe, find somebody stable, stay put, study the yearning, study the dissatisfaction, make sure it's somebody who isn't going to get really angry or personalize it, um, or fire you for, you know, not always, you know, being overtly happy with things. So, um, and find somebody who gets attachment, right? Because otherwise, otherwise you're going to get, um, you know, possibly some responses that are really misattuned to where you're really coming from. Um, they'll take you too literally or they'll try to restructure your thinking and get you to start a gratitude journal and be more positive without, without getting to the root of actually what the investment has been in not being able to tap your joy sometimes. So really fun, um, really fun stuff to learn, really fun style to work with, really hopeful style to work with. And that's one thing for me with this style is I generally feel really, really delighted to work with these folks. And that can, that can almost be like a confusion, right? Because they're used to um, maybe having somebody just hone right in on their distress and maybe like kind of fall down that hole with them. Or, you know, they're used to being rejected or feeling rejected um, for, for the level of like apparent neediness that they're bringing in. But um, I just, I see so much hope with this um, style. I see it change all the time. It happens bit by bit. And it's uh, really exciting to find out who you really are. It's really exciting to really get to a place where you're connected with yourself genuinely and you're able to connect with somebody else from that place of genuineness. Um, one of the biggest gifts for me as a counselor really is getting to be some part of facilitating that and really being able to go from 
you know, seeing you be anxious to please me or worried about where I'm at to really feeling like secure, feeling your own smarts and being able to actually look out at me with like a genuine connection. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing when these folks start to rest into silences and trust that the other person is there, when these folks start to um, act on their own dreams. So, um, gosh, I'm already 25 minutes in. <laughs> I just had another thought, maybe I'll do more videos on this. Do you have questions? Do you have things that resonate? Do you have things that don't quite add up? What have your experiences been like with this style? If this is something that you that you encounter in your life, and um, yeah, what's new for you in this information? What would you like to hear more about? Um, it's been delightful talking with you as always, and I'll be back in just about another week or so. <laughs> Thanks and bye for now.